Released for the Nintendo GameCube in the second half of 2004, three years after the first installment, Pikmin 2 brings back Spaceman protagonist Olimar for another microscopic adventure. In his return to the hostile planet on which he crashed in his first appearance, Olimar is now joined by a co-pilot, Louis, as the two of them explore the surface and subterranean layers of this world in the search of treasure for as long as their mission takes. Though they've all done well critically, Pikmin 2 just barely pulls out the highest critic score in the entire series, with a 90% on Metacritic, and is often recommended as a must-play GameCube title among gaming journalists. Many players and reviewers approved of the removal of the first game's 30-day time limit as a less stressful format for the Pikmin experience, in which players could really enjoy the world Nintendo had created for them, and approach their goals however they wanted, one day at a time. Cooperative gameplay in the main story, a major lacking point for anyone who's played any Pikmin game, was experimented with but could not be fully implemented due to how much it limited Nintendo's version of the game's intended single-player experience. Luckily, both cooperative and competitive two-player content did make it into the final game, though we'll get into that later. While the series has been successful enough for multiple sequels and spin-offs, it has also been fortunate enough to have had every major entry ported to the most current hardware on the market. That is to say, all four main Pikmin games are available on the Nintendo Switch. With a combined remaster of both Pikmin 1 and 2 releasing in June of 2023, making these 20-year-old games much more accessible for modern audiences. Personally, Pikmin 2 has always been a favorite game of mine, and was featured in the very first video on this channel several years ago. Therefore, giving it another proper glance, I hope to make clear what's so great about Pikmin 2. Almost immediately following the events of the first Pikmin game, Captain Olimar finally returns home to discover that the shipping company he works for not only has gone bankrupt, but is still severely in debt, amassing an IOU of a whopping 10,000 POCOs, the standard Hakutation currency. The president of Hakutat Freight explains that the new hire, Louis, lost a very valuable shipment of golden pick pick carrots, costing the company several thousand POCOs and forcing him to sell every asset right down to Olimar's beloved ship. Upon discovery that a souvenir from Olimar's vacation is worth a substantial portion of their debt, the president sends Olimar back to the world of PNF 404 with the assistance of Louis and the company's own ship in order to find more of these treasures and pay back the company's loan. Since Olimar has returned to this planet on purpose, he's fully prepared for however long the trip may take, and no longer has to complete his task in under 30 days. In fact, there's no time limit at all, with one of the only negative aspects of dragging the game out being the fact that you'll eventually stop receiving interesting end-of-day messages. Otherwise, the player is free to explore to their heart's content, fully taking in this unique, creative, and at this point even nostalgic world at their own pace feeling no guilt as they explore every corner of this microscopic ecosystem, or spend a whole day just bolstering the numbers of their Pikmin army. The sarcastic, speaking ship which houses Olimar and Louis during their adventure breaks up the silence experienced in the first game by catching the player up to speed should they not know or remember how to play Pikmin, and also explains the more complex game mechanics and plot points in an entertaining way without the use of Olimar's journal entries. This unnamed ship also has a detachable pod, which will follow our explorers underground in their search for more treasure. The game's first environment, the Valley of Repose, is a winter-themed area that contrasts the deeply green and natural settings Olimar found himself in during his earlier adventure. Here, after a less-than-perfect landing sequence, the player learns how to navigate the game's world between control of both of their explorers, as well as how to utilize Pikmin between the two of them in order to complete tasks in a brand new way than was possible in Pikmin 1. The second stage is The Awakening Wood, which features a spring-themed reworking of the Forest of Hope level from our first adventure to this planet. A few geographical changes can be noted, such as bodies of water or destructible walls in new areas. Once again, this stage shows off some of the most impressive and photorealistic visuals that the GameCube was capable of, with a bright and welcoming environment decorated with falling cherry blossom petals and the shadows of leaves drifting in the wind high above. 
perplexing pool, the heavily flooded summer-themed stage is once again a returning setting, being a redesign of the first game's Distant Spring. One of the biggest challenges to overcome in the experience of the first Pikmin game was the difficulty of, or downright inability, to multitask. Other than leaving Pikmin to break or build something off by their lonesome, there wasn't really a way to make sure things were actually being done before you lose daylight. On top of that, players would have to regularly return to their camp for the sole reason of collecting their idle Pikmin which have delivered resources or treasures. With the ability to alternate between Olimar and Louie, as well as both of them having the same capabilities, one could be left at the base to join up later once certain tasks are completed, or split off with Pikmin of a particular type to do something more active and complex, while the other character is used for completing a more idle, time-consuming task. This control scheme even allowed for more complex strategies in combat, such as flanking maneuvers with two parties on either side of your prey, or the rapid switching of Pikmin types depending on enemy weaknesses. Instead of flying off to a new environment right after their first leisurely day of learning the game's basic controls, players instead have to return to their initial landing site in the Valley of Repose to learn about what is possibly the largest new feature in the Pikmin experience, which would be the introduction of caves and dungeons. Every level now has three or four caves, which the player can dive into with whichever Pikmin are currently in their party, for a procedurally generated spelunking adventure in the search for larger monsters, more valuable treasures, and much more intricate environments, which make up the eerie underworld beneath Pikmin's soft and colorful surface. Once the player has entered a cave, they're generally unable to replenish any of the Pikmin they lose along the way, and they'll have to find the geyser out in order to exit, which lies beyond an unknown number of floors and monsters. In other words, the player has to make do with whatever soldiers they bring along with them, no matter the surprises they face throughout each cave. Many sublevels throughout the game's numerous caves will be randomly generated using recognizable pieces to create different structures, paths, and challenges every time the player enters the same hole in the ground. No matter if the player is resuming their search for treasure, trying again after a previously failed spelunk, or possibly restocking on certain Pikmin types, they'll always be greeted with something different to keep the game fresh every time it's played. This randomization is justified in-universe by the same powerful magnetic field below the planet's surface that halts the passage of time while underground. Some of the caves feature indoor settings, such as toy box or living room aesthetics that give the man-made objects that make up many of this game's treasures a place to blend in and feel at home. These sorts of caves also provide a nice contrast to the outdoor settings that the player spends their time in above ground without being the same dark and murky tunnels that are usually found underground. While exploring caves, the bodies of fallen enemies aren't turned into Pikmin, but are actually worth a few spare coins towards repayment of the company's debt. This means that even if they're having trouble collecting the more difficult yet valuable treasures, players can at the very least revisit older dungeons to progress towards their ultimate goal, while also bolstering their Pikmin army and practicing the game's mechanics. Some monsters that dwell in Pikmin 2's later caves are much more likely to search out the player, creating immediate threats as certain floors are reached, reducing the amount of time the player has to freely strategize. Some monsters will also regenerate health if not absorbed into the rocket or an onion, and will soon hop back up if left unattended for too long. Additionally, sometimes on the more difficult floors, players will be surprised by enemies and even bomb rocks that drop on them from above with little to no warning, testing the player's focus and reflexes in order to keep their Pikmin safe. This game features one of my favorite, and in my opinion, one of the most terrifying bosses I've faced in a video game, which I won't show any footage of, but I will name, being the Water Wraith. Anyone who knows about this boss knows the sense of dread and panic this creature brings upon its first, and possibly every, encounter with the player, though also understands that it's best experienced by new players without any preconceptions. At the same time, the way this monster is overcome is simultaneously clever and funny, though somehow still doesn't detract from the pressure exuded by this enemy on future encounters. In order to spice things up in combat, this entry introduced two types of consumable power-ups that could be used to aid the Pikmin in battle. One is the Purple Ultra Bitter Spray, which is burped up by our leading spacemen in order to turn an enemy in front of them into stone for a short time. The other power-up, quite literally in fact, is the Ultra Spicy Spray, which stimulates the Pikmin, giving them more speed and strength for a short time. There are two new Pikmin types introduced in the sequel, Purple and White, which are both only found underground, and don't have their own onion ship to live in. 
Purple Pikmin are slower than the others, but can carry 10 times the load of any other Pikmin types, pack a heartier punch in combat, and can also be used to more easily overcome weight-based puzzles. The white Pikmin are much swifter than the rest of your troops, are immune to poisonous gases, and can see objects buried just beneath the ground. Although, they won't do much good in a fight outside of poisoning their enemy upon being devoured. There is another unit to be commanded by the player in this game that follows a few specific rules and doesn't appear in any other Pikmin entry other than this second one, and only then in certain late game caves and a few challenge mode levels. These other creatures are parasitic forms of Pikmin that have infected the common enemy monster, the Bulborb, and transformed into something appropriately dubbed the Bulbmen. These Bulbmen can only be brought under our leader's command if their parent is defeated, and while these rare soldiers have to stay underground, they are resistant to every elemental type and thus a very useful asset to players trying to keep their Pikmin safe in dangerous late game caverns. A couple entries in the Pikmin series tow an odd line into spoiler territory due to the fact that there is just as much content to be experienced after the main objective has been completed and the credits have rolled. In the original Pikmin video that jump-started this channel, I avoided even mentioning much of what happens after the second game's credits, but at this point, roughly 20 years after the game was released, these late-game features have less to do with spoiling and more with incentivizing anyone who may one day get a chance to try this game and doesn't realize how much is truly in store for them. After the game's primary goal of 10,000 Pokos have been collected and the player's main objective is completed, a cutscene will play that shows Olimar blasting off and looking back fondly on his second adventure with the Pikmin, when he suddenly realizes that Louis has been left behind. During the credits, players are shown clips of Louis exploring and passing time on the planet he's now been stranded on. Once Olimar returns home, the president of Hawkatit Freight is astounded to hear that there is yet more treasure to be found. After being told that Louis was left behind, the president himself volunteers to make the trip to fill Louis's leadership position. Once the player returns to the planet, a fourth level will be accessible, the autumn-themed Wistful Wild, which is aptly named due to featuring set dressings from both the initial crash site and the final stage of Pikmin 1. And to add a little more perspective to the unique pacing of this game, reaching the original goal of 10,000 Pokos only requires roughly half of the treasures there are to be found throughout the game's whole world. Alongside a journal of every treasure that the player has collected so far, Pikmin 2 features a bestiary for all of the weird, unique creatures that players meet on this alien planet. In the examination window, the player can even throw pick pick carrots at each subject in this encyclopedia to see how they would attack or otherwise interact with Pikmin. The player can also reference Olimar's notes to discover several pages worth of additional information on every life form that's been encountered on the planet, from bosses down to the most innocuous plants. Olimar's journal features very astute scientific entries in the bestiary, contrasting the commentary found while inspecting the treasure hoard, which is more casual and playful, providing as much character development as it does world building. On top of this, once a collection of related items has been amassed in entirety, the ship will come up with sales pitches for each item in that group to justify their value in repaying the debt. Each major dungeon in the game features one piece of treasure that's valuable not just for its cost towards the overall deficit, but because various pieces of our character's equipment will be upgraded by it as well, such as a wider whistle range, immunity to various elements, and other enhancements to Olimar and Louis as playable characters rather than just personified cursors. For example, once you have the knapsack, either explorer can be carried back to the ship as long as they have at least a single Pikmin with them in order to send one character back to base camp while taking care of something else at the same time with your second leader. Once the player finds a specific treasure in the main game, they'll also unlock a challenge mode that can be accessed from the main menu. This mode contains 30 short bonus missions in which either one or two players have to find a key on one of the cave's floors and escape before time runs out, finally granting the cooperative play that feels so natural for this concept. Like the caves in the main story, the floors of the challenge mode stages are also randomized, sometimes giving players better odds at a perfect run depending on how the treasures and hazards are all laid out. Levels in challenge mode will also receive a special designation if they were completed without the player losing any of the provided Pikmin. The music of Pikmin 2 was composed by Hajime Wakai, who wrote the music for the first Pikmin game as well, though files within the game suggest that some contributions were made by sound director Katsumi Totaka. 
For context of their histories within Nintendo, composer Wakai began with Star Fox 64 and F-Zero X, and has most recently directed the sound design in Zelda games Breath of the Wild and Tears of the Kingdom. Meanwhile, sound director Totaka has led the music department throughout the Luigi's Mansion, Animal Crossing, and Yoshi franchises. The balance of the context-sensitive music and elaborately realistic sound effects creates one of the greatest audio experiences that I've personally witnessed in the world of gaming. It's quite odd to listen to pieces of the soundtrack on their own because they typically blend so well into the atmosphere of the game alongside the murmurs of your Pikmin and the steps of your adventurers as they traipse through grass, snow, stone, and so on, rustling through giant foliage as they go. The soundtrack features numerous unique musical flourishes and vamping segments for specific events within the game, such as discovering special treasures, trying out the sprays for the first time, meeting new Pikmin types, and several other times that the ship will pop up to explain new features to the player. Alongside every stage having their own themes and motifs, there are also multiple layers to every musical piece within the game depending on what the player is doing, where they are, what their environment is made of, and so on, which creates one of the most natural and pleasant soundtracks to be experienced in a Nintendo game. So let's pick apart these layers, beginning with the major stage themes. The introductory winter setting of the Valley of Repose features almost exclusively percussion instruments, including sleigh bells and a plucky harp-like instrument to give a crystalline and snowy sensation. The Awakening Wood is almost entirely brass, with a brave and adventurous melody played by trumpets and trombones supported by some light percussion. Perplexing Pool focuses on a piano melody with some heavily reverberating ambient effects as support. And lastly, The Wistful Wild features the only overworld theme that I would classify as intimidating, exuding an air of a final stretch of wilderness yet to be conquered. Tension is dynamically added to each of these themes whenever an enemy is near, and heavier percussion will fully kick in when a fight begins. The music played while recovering treasures may be more whimsical and celebratory, though the working music is often still very hopeful and uplifting, as it encourages the player's progress subconsciously. The music even changes to a particular tune when standing near any of the berry-producing spiderwort plants if the level has any. Near sunset, every level's main theme changes to a minimalistic, sleepy tune played on something like a glockenspiel or even a wind-up music box. The caves also have all of the same variations of near enemies, working, treasure, and so on. Though, as a slight difference, the music in each cave will become more tranquil and peaceful as the floor is cleared of threats as well as treasures. The soundtrack of every sublevel of every cave is determined by the material that floor is made of, with several variations of songs existing for floors made of soil, metal, concrete, tile, and so on, with some caves or sublevels also getting their own specific tunes if they house major enemies, treasures, or other specific features. And lastly, on top of the setting, time, and context, the audio also changes depending on which character is currently being controlled. The music's played at a straight tempo while Olimar is in command, and it's slightly swung while the player is controlling Louie, giving his soundtrack a bit more of a lazy feeling. This discrepancy really emphasizes the difference between Olimar's composed demeanor versus Louis's carefree and almost apathetic style, even when these two characters don't utter a word outside of their own names. I know the Pikmin series is a Miyamoto original concept, just like Mario or Zelda, but it's still quite shocking to see how quickly it received a sequel, not only releasing on the same hardware as its premier predecessor, but at the height of the GameCube's lifespan no less, not saved for the Twilight Era or postponed to the Wii. 
Pikmin 2 was the first game I personally played that revealed to me how weird and wonderful video games could be, and to this day it has remained a personal top 5 video game experience ever since first renting it from a blockbuster in 2004. I honestly think that the Pikmin series was nearly perfected by this second entry, and that many of the greatest features in the third and fourth titles have simply been twists or modern technical improvements on the great format that Pikmin 2 refined, from the premiere title's rough yet resoundingly original presentation. I think this is one of my favorite strategy games because of how much I am compelled to care for my expendable units. Losing individual Pikmin to explosions, drowning, carnivorous beasts, and any other abrupt and upsetting hazard is far more emotionally detrimental to the player than any random villagers, soldiers, and worker drones of most other strategy games, no matter how great the losses of those large-scale games may be. As far as strategy games go, I always enjoy how Pikmin isn't just a resource management simulator that the player lords over from above until it's time to engage in one glorious battle. Pikmin's blend of combat, puzzles, and strategy gives players control over their hundred tiny hunter-gatherers, but doesn't take the player themselves out of the excitement. That is what's so great about Pikmin 2. Thank you all for joining us on this episode of What's So Great About Gaming, as we took a look under the surface of Pikmin 2. If you want to support the channel, make sure to like, subscribe, ring the bell, and do whatever else the algorithm demands of us to keep up with our favorite content. Also, consider joining our gaming community on Discord or watching bonus videos on Patreon. If you want to hear what's great about another game, check out the link to our last episode, The Legend of Zelda The Wind Waker, on screen or in the description. And let us know your thoughts on Pikmin 2 and what games you'd like to see in the future. Thanks again for watching, now go play a great game. We'll see you next time.